Hello, boys and girls of Credit Union land, and welcome to episode 45 of the CU Insight Experience. My name is Randy Smith, and I'm one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. This show is a, a special one for me. Uh, my guest today is Bill Cheney, uh, the president and CEO of Schools First Credit Union out there in California. But we're recording this in an awesome location, Mombasa, Kenya. Our friends at Akaska invited both of us out. Bill was a keynote at their 20th Saka Congress, which is the largest credit union conference on the continent. So we've been having a blast all week. I've gotten to know Bill a, a lot better and, and Chrissy as well, who happened to be Bill's, Chrissy is Bill's wife, who was also my a mentor in my DE class. So we, we've had a ton of fun this week getting to know each other more, and it was the perfect opportunity for us to grab a few minutes and, and record an episode of the podcast. We talked about servant leadership which happened to be the topic of his keynote. We talked about how service always comes first at schools first and also uh, you know his path there many of us remember him from his days as the CEO of CUNA so this was a ton of fun I, I know I enjoyed the conversation I think you will too and with that I give you my conversation with Mr. Bill Cheney enjoy Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Randy. It's my pleasure. Great uh, to be this, with you. It's a, a pretty cool location we're in. Well, we're in a, a conference room, but we happen to be in Mombasa, Kenya. So, yes. uh, And we're attending the 20th Saka Congress that's put on by our friends at Akaska. And you had a keynote yesterday. so I did, yes. That, it's, Enjoyed that. How has the experience been for you and Chrissy? It's been great. The Congress started... Gosh, I guess it's Wednesday today, the, or no, it's Thursday today. <laughs> it's Thursday, yeah. But uh, yes, I had a keynote presentation yesterday talking about servant leadership and inclusion and really enjoyed it. This is a great group. There's almost 900 people here from throughout Africa and actually a total of 35 countries represented. It's pretty crazy. It's more than yeah. uh, that's my first time here. I think you were here a few years back. But I was four years ago. I was in Kenya at their uh, conference in Kuala. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, I've been blown away. And, and something else that I noticed, and I was taking pictures during your keynote that we'll put in the show notes, but uh, the engagement, like everybody's yes. just listening and taking notes. Oh, right. and, I mean, at every single session, the breakouts and uh, the pre-conference workshops were line I packed, mean, packed yeah. standing room only so right. i thought it was pretty amazing i was excited to talk to you today when i was here over the summer and mm -hmm. you know lois and i did a podcast from the don bosco special school and right. schools first was part of that uh, by right. donating the the new uniforms yes so a question that i had for you is halfway around the world why right. is that important for schools first uh it, not only your credit union and your team, but also the members of Schools First to, to give back that way. Right. So that really started with our team. And uh, this last February at our Dream Team Conference, which we have on President's Day every year, we get together for half a day and we talk about our Dream Team values and we talk about member service, which is our number one priority. But we also, when we bring our whole team together like that, we want to do something to give back. And the last several years prior to this year, we'd done some local things, which we also did this year. But we have, a, well, back then we had close to 2,000 team members. And so we have all those people together. Why not take some time and do something to give back to the community? And in this case, it was a global community and the global credit union community because that Don Bosco school is supported by ACOSCA, which is the African Confederation of, of Savings and Credit Cooperatives. SACOs, or what we call credit unions. And so w it was a way for us to help them. And our team absolutely loved the opportunity. Uh, we did that uh, this year. We also did our team put together mechanical hands for people who need that prosthetic device. I've seen that and, program before. Yes, and they put together for schools in our local area, they put together uh, beehives, you know, the actual wooden. Okay contraptions yeah. that you use to attract bees that make honey and also help to serve the agricultural community around Southern California. As, as you may have heard, there's a real problem with honeybees yep. and, uh, and uh, they're disappearing. And yeah. so 
it was that. And then we did uh, backpacks with school supplies to give to schools. And you can get a lot done with 2,000 people in a short period of time. That's a, that's so, a, that's a yeah, beautiful Yeah, it was part thing. of that effort. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I know we had a chance since we've been here to go back to the school. So you actually yes. got to see the uniforms on the kids. and My first experience at that school, yeah. Uh, and, and I know we've got a video that we'll, we'll share as well. But yeah, what an amazing experience. It was awesome. That, I'm sure for both you and Chrissy to... Yes, and we got some some nice well we had an opportunity to interact with the kids that was the main thing yeah and the teachers uh and the administrators there it's a catholic school so we got to visit with uh, two of the priests yep. who are involved there and um the spirit there and uh, you know we're a school's credit union That's, yeah. so another reason to support uh the school and the teachers in um Kenya. Yeah. So. And like I said, it was amazing. And we, we thank you, all of us that worked on the project this summer. Thank you guys for the, for the support. Cause it, it was something to see, even Absolutely. just them getting new clothes. Um, and my part was easy. I got to visit and be with the students and teachers and, and watch them uh, sing and, uh, and thank us. But you all did all the hard work. You did the, the heavy gotta, lifting and the painting. A, a, a <laughs> shout out to Brent and Lois. I think they did most yeah. of it. So, you know, one of the things in your keynote yesterday that struck me, and I just wanted to add it to, to my list of questions for you, was when you were talking about, I guess, the, the mission statement, the value statement of schools first, empathy was right. one of the words. And I love that. It's one of my favorite words. Um, but right. it, it struck me as something to be right there out in front. And, and I, you talked a lot about service to the members as yes. the key metric, basically. Absolutely. Like if you could share with the listeners, like how does that play through, I guess, you know, in an organization that now has what, 2,400 people? <laughs> so. uh, well, after our merger with Skills Financial, we'll be close to 2,400 uh, team members. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So, so how do, like from a culture standpoint, how is empathy and, you know, some of the other values that you talked about yesterday kept front and center? Well, it's so important to member service. And as I mentioned, that member service is our number one priority. And uh, we have a diverse set of members, even though they all come they're, they're all either school employees or they're family members. But in order to serve them, we have to understand them and their unique situation. So while a teacher in uh, San Diego may share a lot of similarities with a teacher in Los Angeles or now Sacramento, uh, there are differences too. And so we say often when we talk about our members that we're here to serve and not to judge. Lots of things happen to people in life. As I said during my presentation yesterday, life happens. And yeah. so if a member has an issue or a problem, if they're late on a payment or if, or if they're asking for a loan but they've had some difficulty in the past, we can't approve every loan application. But we can sit down and spend the time to understand a member's situation and, and try to empathize with them and try to see how we can help make a difference. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're a credit union like every other credit union in the United States. We're owned by our members. And so they should be our top priority. Absolutely. I, I, I loved hearing about it. And I think it resonated well with the SACOs here in Africa. Right. You know, um, and how, I mean, they are on the ground, right? So, yes. Um, you know, a lot of our listeners will remember you in the past, before Schools First, you were the president and CEO of CUNA, you know, before Jim took the helm. And before that, the, you know, the California Credit Union League. Yes. Um, so from a not only local level now, and we're sitting here in, in Kenya, but so on an international level, but you've had a, a ton of exposure on the national level. How has your experience, I guess I'll, I'll put it, helped you in now, you know, take running schools first credit union? Well, I've worked in credit unions for 32 years, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I shouldn't date myself, but uh, <laughs> and it's been fantastic. And my experience in the trade association world was special. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. California, Nevada Credit Union Leagues for four years and CUNA for four years. You know, I think more than anything, that level of engagement at the, na at the state level and the national level gives you an appreciation for all of the different people in the movement, which are really what makes us special is the people, right? And um, an incredible network of, of friends and contacts not only nationally, but globally, as, as we see here in Kenya. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That, that's probably the main thing is the relationships. Yeah, the yeah. forming the relationships all over. Right. I know that's how we met originally. Yeah. Um, there's a question I have. It's completely a scratch my own itch question. <laughs> um, as you know, my partner is also in the credit union yeah, movement, Jill. Absolutely. And Chrissy, it, to me, she was a, your wife was a mentor in my DE class. Right. So, and that's the first <laughs> chance that we really had to spend some time together. 
It right. seems like credit unions have become a family affair. Do you, how, Most definitely. So the question, <laughs> how do you turn it off at night? Um, you know, Randy, <laughs> I, um, I saw that when we were preparing for this. And so I've given it some thought. And Chrissy and I have talked about it. Yeah. You know, it's um, I've been in the credit unions for 32 years. Chrissy and I have been together for 40 years. So it's also part of her life. Absolutely. And, uh, I'm not sure we do turn it off, yeah. to be honest with you. We turn off work. Right. Well, I guess maybe that's right. The, the, we do. Yeah. I mean... Not very often, <laughs> but we do get away from it. But in terms of uh, it's a passion that we share. And even though she's never worked at a credit union per se, or at least she's never gotten paid to work. She at never a paid to work at one. Yeah, um, yeah. It's part of her passion as well. We were very young when we started in credit unions in the 80s. And it's it's been a partnership all along. She, at one point, had her own career. Yep. Uh, and to, she does today too. It's just it's more on a volunteer basis. But uh, when we were living in San Antonio, Texas, and I was at security service, she ran an advertising agency back before we had kids. And we were very, very young back then. And I supported her business and she supported mine. It just yep. so happened that my business was credit unions and, and that's sort of become our life. Uh, the advertising agency it kept going for a little while when we first moved to California, but ultimately that sort of wound down yep. and, um, She's been a great partner in yeah. everything I do, whether it was at the credit unions where I've worked or the trade associations or now at Skills First. She's a big part of it all. Absolutely. So. And, you know, have enjoyed the time we've been able to spend together here. So and Absolutely. get to know you both even more. So. Right. So something that I was thinking about and like doing a little research on the interwebs before we, you know, preparing for this was you guys have had some amazing growth since you've taken the helm at Skills First. Right. Um, any hacks or things to share with other credit unions on i mean it's a there's a lot going on right now <laughs> so it's uh you know and quite i mean we're seeing digital transformation and in, in every you know uh um, right. it just the pace of change so are there any hacks that you have for other credit unions uh, well that you've learned from this let me first say schools first was an amazing credit union and on an incredible growth trajectory before i got there yeah. so, <laughs> uh, a lot of what we're doing is just continuing what was started years and years ago Rudy Hanley was my predecessor there, and he and the team there and the board built an incredible credit union. I mean, we may, it's just the focus on member service. And as I said yesterday, our focus on who we serve and how we serve them is what's made us successful. And it's not the same for every credit union, but we've been serving school employees and their family members since 1934. I'm not sure how we know how to do anything else, nope. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that focus that's made it successful. And so, you know, this old management book, uh, Good to Great, talks about the flywheel. Yep. Our flywheel is that we serve school employees and their family members. Our team does an amazing job. Those school employees and family members tell their fellow school employees or their school employees tell their family members. And so... It's really driven by service and membership growth. Very great service by our team, both face-to-face -face and digitally, yep. which we can talk about in a second. And then the referrals of our members to other members. You know, our membership growth has been consistently 8 to 9% a year. That's amazing. And we're about to surpass 1 million members with our merger. And so that fuels the asset growth. And quite frankly... We grow. We've grown from $10 billion to $16 billion in the just over five years that I've been there. But that's been driven really by membership growth. And, and it happens because of service, which again is our number one priority. And it's world-class personal service delivered by our team. But it's also making sure that we have the tools available for our members to serve themselves as well as our team to be efficient in serving our members. And that's, in terms of what we're doing, perhaps it's new or different, is uh, we have to focus on service as our number one priority, but we've also made significant investments in technology. Okay. And uh, mobile banking and online banking. In fact, we're going through a digital transformation right now. It's not going to be complete until late next year, but that's huge for us. How do you personalize technology? How does a school employee get the same sort of personal service from their electronic device that they do sitting across the table from a, a member service representative? That, that is the the challenge, I think, most of the time, right? Um, right. So, you know, 
as we've been talking about schools first, I, the, there's a question I, I like to ask in the podcast, and that's, is there just a, something fundamentally in credit unions that you think needs to change to stay relevant with this pace of change and with digital transformation? Or <sighs> There's never been a better time to be a credit union or to work in a credit unit, in my opinion. Yep. I think a combination of the global financial crisis as well as, uh, quite frankly, missteps by the banking industry, which continue today. When I was at CUNA in 2011, we had Bank Transfer Day, which that little spark, which turned into its own movement, <laughs> was started because Bank of America decided, wouldn't it be a great idea to start charging our members for debit transactions, right. yeah. which they backed off of. Uh, eventually, I think they may have quietly introduced it again. I'm not sure. I'm not a Bank of America <laughs> customer. But, you know, that was followed shortly by Wells Fargo, who, you know, <laughs> continues to get fined and, and has problems with their whole situation with their customers. And it, there wasn't that long ago, Randy, that Wells Fargo was, was considered the leader in customer service. Yep. And now they're the leader in corruption. That's what it is. And yeah. deceiving their members so, or their like customers. One so, bad story after another. Um, but, you know, it, it's nothing that needs to change. But it, what I think it's important for us all to realize is that it's really just about the member and, and your team members that serve the member. This is a people business. Absolutely. And so we can talk about technology. Technology is a tool to serve the members. We can talk about growth. Growth is an outcome of service. If you're concerned about your growth, figure out how to better serve your members. And guess what? You'll get more members, which will lead to growth. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I want to be respectful of the time so and move on to the uh, the second part of the show, the the leadership and life hacks. I was excited to talk to you about some of these and even more excited after your, your keynote yesterday. Mm -hmm. So you're at CUNA. What inspires right. you to take the, the gig as president and CEO of Schools that, First? That was a tough one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, very, very, very difficult decision. Uh, Rudy Hanley had been, well, ha has been, still is, a mentor to me throughout my career. Uh, we first, uh, my wife Chrissy and I, and our children at the time, well, they're still our children, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they were um, six and nine at the time, which is hard to believe it's been that long. We first moved to California in 1997. Okay. After 10 years at security service. And Rudy was one of the first people I met. Rudy Hanley, Dave Chatfield, Larry Sharp, some people who are retired yep. and some are gone now, unfortunately. Uh, but they were the first people that re just reached out to me, how can we help? And Rudy was, you know, Rudy back then was a CEO of Orange County Teachers. And uh, I was brand new. I was 36 years old. <laughs> uh, Texan, moving yeah, to California. Texan, what did I know? <laughs> from San Antonio, let me tell you, moving from San Antonio, Texas to Los Angeles, California <laughs> is a big deal. <laughs> That's got to be a little culture shock at yeah. first. Yeah. You know, my wife tells a story. She got to the school and they said, you know, write down you know, someone who's not related to you, who's an emergency contact locally. We, we didn't really have any. You didn't have one. Yep. Yeah. And so we were able to use somebody from, from the credit union, from Xerox. <laughs> but uh, so Rudy sort of took me under his wing back then. And, uh, you know, interestingly, when Dave Chatfield retired and there was an opening at the California Credit Union League, one of the people who called me back then, because I was a very happy CEO of, of Xerox, yep. now Exceed, but back then Xerox Credit Union, one of the phone calls I got was from Rudy. He wanted to have dinner with me, which I thought, well, isn't that nice? You know, <laughs> turns out the subject of that dinner was, wouldn't I like to consider being at the California Credit Union League president? Okay. So, <laughs> one thing led to another. Yeah. Four years later, um, Dan Micah decided to retire. And uh, one of the people on the search committee was Rudy Hanley. <laughs> <laughs> Again, wouldn't you like to right. consider probably? <laughs> right. And then four years later, Rudy wasn't part of the selection process, but Rudy did contact me and said, hey, I'm leaving soon, and would you consider throwing your hat in the ring? And so that started it. Yep. I hadn't really considered leaving. I had only been at CUNA a relatively short time, four years. But credit unions like schools first don't come along yep. all that often. Yep. And I had started my career in credit unions and worked at natural person credit unions for 19 years before I went to the trade association. And it was just one of those things in talking to the school's first board and knowing Rudy and some of the team members there that, who I knew well over the years, it just seemed to make perfect sense. It was difficult, very difficult to leave CUNA, 
but they're in good hands. And uh, getting back to a natural person credit union, I'm closer to the end of my career now than I am to the beginning. Uh, that's not an announcement. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm not retiring not anytime anywhere, soon. Yeah. But the opportunity to go back to a natural person credit union like Skills First was just too good to pass up. Brings it full circle. Eh? Right. <laughs> How has the inspiration changed now in the past five years with time on the job? Or has it? <laughs> it's just gotten stronger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, uh, it's, that is an amazing credit union. And I can say that because I've only been a part of it for five of their 85 years of existence. I talked about the flywheel. It's, it's just an amazing combination of the members and the team and the affiliation that we have and the expertise that our team has in serving our very special group of people, school employees and their family members. And uh, I don't say this in any sort of way to be conceited, <laughs> But I just don't think anybody can do it as well as we can yeah. in California. Yeah. And especially now combining with Schools Financial, it makes perfect sense. Uh, they're in Northern California. We're in Southern California. They had made a determination, uh, Tim Marriott, their CEO and their board, that they wanted to refocus on serving school employees. They have a statewide charter to serve school employees. We have a statewide charter okay. to serve school employees. So when Tim Marriott first approached me, about this merger. And by the way, it started with them, not with us. <laughs> um, that's just a whole new opportunity, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you think, more teachers. well, you've been doing it for five years. Is it still as exciting as the day you started? Well, it's even more so now because of this merger, because, you know, we're going to be uh, a significant benefit to our membership and potential members statewide. I was going to say and, across the uh, list. The yeah. sky's the limit. So that's, it's very exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. Um, I, I, Assuming I know the, the answer to this question, but since I was in your keynote yesterday, but yes. how would you describe your leadership style? Well, the board, the board at uh, Schools First asked me that, of course, when <laughs> I was interviewing with them. And, and it's servant leadership, which is one of the theme of this conference. And I don't say it because it's the theme of this conference. Yep. But I think in credit unions, most of the people I know in the credit union movement, I would classify as servant leaders. And they're more than that, too. But credit unions are a perfect environment for a servant leader. I'm not a command and control person at all. I never have been. I think if you ask my, the people that I work with at schools yeah. first, they would agree. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> how Maybe would, you should do a podcast. They, yeah, should ask them, right? How would they describe? But, how do you uh, think they would describe? Well, I yeah. think they, I think they would. Yeah. I do. I hope so. Um, <laughs> look, it, it's about service and that's not what servant leadership ha really talks about, yeah. but I'm there to work with the board of directors to help and my our strategic coordinating committee, which we call our my direct reports and and some a few other people in the highest level of our organization, to develop a strategy to better serve our members. It's not about me. Quite frankly, it's not about them. It's about our nine hundred and twenty thousand, soon to be one point one million members, and and how we can serve them. So, I talked about our leadership practices yeah. uh, during my remarks yesterday, and I don't know how you describe. Uh, servant leadership more than if you just look at our leadership practices to lead with the heart, to model the way, to inspire a shared vision, to challenge the process, and to grow together. I mean, that's servant leadership. So yep. it's a perfect fit for me, I think. <laughs> From my perspective. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. I, I truly enjoyed your keynote yesterday, and I, I was wanting to take time to give George from Acosca some praise because he had yes. you speaking, and then today he had Maurice Smith speaking also. He's fantastic, yes. Uh, the U.S. is well represented here, that's <laughs> right. for sure. So it was, uh, but the message is what I, I thought was so engaging, and like I said, with everybody that was here. So right. uh, a question I have for you, um, going from, you, you know, getting your start in credit unions, Going to the trade association world, coming back to credit unions. Yes. Has your leadership style changed since you were a young CEO? I don't think so. My certain aspects of it have changed, but sort of the overall idea of, of how you lead, I, I don't think has changed. I will say this. I started my career at Security Service, who was a client back in the day long way back in the day <laughs> right. uh, out of college i went to work for anderson consulting which is now accenture and that at one time was a great organization accenture is still a great organization but we went while i was there through a whole series of 
growth times and bad times. The 80s in Texas were not exactly the best right. economic times, and so there were lots of layoffs at Anderson. I was fortunate during that time to be working for a number of different successful organizations uh, in, in financial services primarily in San Antonio, Texas, and other places. But one of my clients was security service. And uh, what a contrast to the leadership at Arthur Anderson right. and Anderson Consulting uh, and the leadership and approach at security service. And I had worked at some banks and savings and loans as a consultant before I went to security service. And I had been a member of a credit union when I was in college I worked part time for the state of Texas. Okay, the state property tax board that always makes you popular. Yeah, right. The property, <laughs> the state property tax board. So I worked there half time when I was going to school and joined the public employees credit union. So I knew a little bit about credit unions and what made them different. I got my first car loan from a credit union, as did I. Which right out of college, just what I needed was a brand new car uh, right. coming oh. out of college. My, mine was a used car in college. <laughs> right. but I don't know how I got a loan actually. <laughs> right, right. But then. Uh, Security service, great credit union, $300 million in assets, and I started there as CIO. And so my role was different, right? My first job there was to lead a conversion, a huge systems conversion effort. Uh, but they were a member-focused organization, uh, different in the sense that they had started out as a military credit union, and they're really more community now. But I got to work there through a period of, of great growth and expansion. So the leadership there was different because I wasn't the one. I was supporting our CEO in establishing the vision and carrying out the plan, but I wasn't the CEO. Yep. Xerox, actually, when I went to be the CEO of Xerox, they were roughly the same size as security service was when I started there. But I moved to a smaller credit union and came in there also after a very successful uh, CEO had left. Kevin Foster Ketty was a CEO there before me. And leadership there, I think that's where I, what was my first CEO position. Right, yeah. So I guess that's where you sort of hone your skills and figure out what works. But Xerox, the corporation was, at the time, was definitely a people-focused organization. At the time when I started, was led by a servant leader who retired and they went through some very difficult leadership transitions. So that was interesting to contrast how we managed our credit union. When I say we, I mean myself and the board and, and the management team versus the changes that they tried to make at Xerox that almost put them out of business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they were actually saved barely by some internal promotions and, and refocusing on people. They brought in a former CFO, from IBM, who decided they should be focusing on the numbers, not the people. And it almost destroyed the it company. It almost took them. Uh, and yeah. since then, they've been successful. But it's been because they've gotten back to focusing on people. That's So you learn, you learn from those things, yeah, right? I, you're you watching learn, it. <laughs> you learn lessons from leadership about, hey, that looks like it works really well. But you also learn less, lessons in leadership from, oh, my God. I don't want to do that. <laughs> We're crying out loud, don't do that, right? <laughs> So yeah. I, I love asking this question. Is, is there something your team has heard you say so many times they could finish the sentence? You know, that one they're like, we know, Bill. <laughs> um, that's interesting. So one thing I say a lot is um, we need to make more loans to more members. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not from a growth perspective, from a service perspective. So we're $16 billion in assets. We have a $10 billion loan portfolio and a $6 billion investment portfolio. I'd much rather have Make more loans to more members. Make more loans. It's better for the members, and it's better for the cooperative if we can make more loans to more members. Uh, so that is definitely one. And then the other thing I say, probably every time we're together, because we have been growing so fast, and particularly more recently with this merger, yep. that we don't, we don't have a growth strategy. We have a service strategy. And the growth is the outcome of service. In fact... I was telling someone the other day, if you ask anyone in our organization what our number one priority is, they will say, they know it's member service. That's there right. is no question. Even if they've worked there a week, <laughs> they, know, they know that it's member service. If you ask 2,000 employees what our ROA is or what our growth rate is, yep. I, other than our CFO <laughs> and his team, <laughs> yeah, who has to think I'm not it. sure anybody would know. Yeah. We don't talk about the numbers except as an outcome. We tell them what they are, but we don't focus on the numbers. And they hear that 
constantly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good stuff there. Hey, when you think back to earlier in your career for a young leader out there, is there a mistake that you made or just over time, um, is there a mistake that you just see young leaders make over and over again? Hmm, a mistake that I made. I've been very happy with how my career has progressed. Yeah. I'm, I'm in a great spot now. I'm sure I've made lots. <laughs> let me first say, I've made lots of mistakes. We all do. Yeah. Right. But yeah. think about advice for young leaders. And I, we talk about this in our organization, too, because I meet with our team. From a perspective of how to advance your own career or how to get more involved or to contribute more to the credit union, to the cooperative, is don't be afraid to, to raise your hand. Yeah. Be curious. Ask questions. If you have an idea, don't be afraid to run it up the flagpole. Challenge the process is one of our organizational leadership practices. And we really want our team to tell us their ideas about how we can better serve our members. And you know what? It's the team members with the greatest potential that are the ones that speak up first. And um, you can see that as a leader. Uh, you respect, if you're a good leader, in my opinion, yep. you respect that someone is willing to stand up and challenge the process. Has there been a piece of advice or a life lesson that you received that you find yourself going back to often? Um, well, some of it is that uh, don't be afraid to, to raise your hand and get involved. Back in the uh, my Arthur Anderson days, there's a lot of, uh, that I learned. There's a lot I learned at Arthur Anderson that was positive. Yeah, there was a lot I learned of of what I was talking about earlier, which is don't you know? Oh my God, <laughs> right. <laughs> why, why did the you command do that? the command and control yeah. stuff? Yep. Right or the complete? I'll never forget, and I heard it more often. It, it still makes me cringe when I think about it. I'll give you an example. So. I graduated from the University of Texas on May 22nd, a long time ago, 1982. <laughs> and I was to start my career at Arthur Anderson on Monday. That, so I didn't have a lot of time off. Yeah. No, uh, no but, gap here for so, you. <laughs> yeah, the 24th. Well, maybe Tuesday. Maybe that was Memorial Day weekend. I don't know. It was a long time ago. In any event, the week before my start date on Friday – in the Dallas office of Arthur Anderson, which is where I started my career, they had an all-team meeting for the consulting division. So they said, we'd like you to come up to this meeting. And I said, okay, but I'm graduating on Saturday. And, you know, we have family coming to town. It's a, it's a college graduation. And by the way, my wife, is. we got married after our junior year, my wife is graduating on the same day and her family's going to be there and you know, I, this didn't really work out for my schedule. And they said, that sounds like a personal problem to me. They actually said that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I was in Dallas <laughs> yeah. on Friday for the meeting. So I, maybe shame on me uh, for not uh, standing up for myself. But, you know, you if you're going to be successful in an organization, at some point you do have to follow the rules. And it all worked out ultimately. But it's the people in your organization are so important. You can't expect people to work like machines and you can't treat them like machines. You have to treat people like people. Absolutely. And people have lives and people have families and the organization sometimes has to be flexible enough to work with the people. So that, because society is different than it was, work is different than it was 30 or 40 years ago. We're a family at the credit union and uh, we need to treat each other like family. One of the questions I've been thinking about the past few days was the idea of messaging and it, it's service. You mentioned yes. somebody's there one week. They know the number one priority is service. Right. How do you keep the message fresh or is it just that like everybody has to hear it seven times? Uh, you know, when John Spence was on the podcast, he talked about like you have to be so sick of hearing your own message because that's exactly. probably when the teller is hearing it for the first time or whoever it happens to be. Exactly. Right? Like, um, I agree with that. So how do you keep that fresh? How do you keep it all the way through such a, you know, a so large organization? Two of our leadership practices sort of in include that. One is inspire a shared vision, right, of member service and model the way. Okay. We, at every opportunity, we start our discussion with member service. In fact, at a, at a board planning session or at a uh, management team planning, so leadership team planning, so all of our sort of formal interactions, we always start with a member story. 
So I remember service story. So okay. that reinforces. Things. So you bring in new stories each time. Exactly. I know you brought one in here right during your keynote. We as well, did. So yeah. Yes. That's, okay. Yes. Very cool. Anna and Elliot from yeah. our Long Beach branch was was that story, which is an incredible story. I wish we'd gotten the video to work. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was yeah. a great story. But you absolutely have to, uh, quite frankly, beat it to death. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's interesting because our team will keep us honest. We always do meeting evaluations because we want to improve. And there's no way to improve unless you're getting feedback. Yep. And if for whatever reason, anyone feels like we spent too much time on something other than service, we'll hear about it. But you will. Right. People will put it in there. We say we're focused on, on member service, but we talked about team member engagement. Now, that's from their perspective. Right. So yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that. That's what they felt from like. From our it. perspective, team member engagement impacts member service. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. We can't provide world-class service to our members without an uh, exceptional quality team. And so I absolutely understood that. I use that example just because it's not explicitly member service. Right. And so they'll keep us honest. They'll say that wasn't and, member service. And, to my, so, and so somebody might say to me, <laughs> it was member service. We talked about team member engagement and I would, and to which I would say, yes, but they are not making that connection. Right. right. So we have to make that connection for them Absolutely. when we introduce the subject and as we're going through it. So you have to talk about uh, as a leader, uh, or as a vice president to our managers, how does team member engagement impact member service? They didn't get that. And that's not their fault. That's our fault. So you're connecting the dots all the way through with whatever right. you're doing back to member service. Exactly. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, you have a free day. Nothing on the calendar. What is? Uh, oh, what do you do to unwind? Yeah. What I was trying like? to think when the last time I had a free day. <laughs> this time of year, a great free day to me would involve college football. Okay. <laughs> yep. I'm a huge college football <laughs> fan and a, and a University of Texas fan. It's been a little bit of a rough start for us, but we've had a tough schedule. So that and um, Orange County and Los Angeles, California are not real conducive to it, but I'm a big uh, fly fisherman. Okay. <laughs> and um, I love the outdoors and the, particularly the mountains. So we spend a lot of time up in Mammoth, California. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we love that. And in the wintertime, snow skiing, Anytime I can, because that's something we all do as a family. The whole family. So my wife and both our kids and their spouses and everyone. Yeah. So you're, you're building some grandchildren too. Yeah, so yes, they're, they're going to be on yes. the slopes in no time. I'm sure. Exactly. <laughs> the, the the last part of the show, the the rapid fire questions. The questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do you remember the first time you got into memorable trouble? <laughs> that you memorable can share with trouble. Us. <laughs> and I, I would share. say. Can you beat Diana's Grand Theft Auto? So <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, I cannot beat that. I don't think anyone. Can. I don't know. I guess I got in a little trouble in <laughs> in uh, high school. Uh, never much before then. Usually, you know, it's one of those things. And my goodness, I was in high school. You know, graduated in 1978. So yeah. again, things were different back then. Absolutely. Yeah. But and there was no social media. There was no texting. <laughs> there was no. Quite frankly, there was no there. Well, there were some kinds of video games, but you couldn't unless you were sitting across from someone. You yep. couldn't. You weren't playing compete. with anybody else, All right? So it was very different. So we go out and hang out at someone's farm, or go hang out. There's a place in Dallas called Flagpole Hill. I don't even know if it's still there. Okay, <laughs> but you know there would be young teenagers having a good time. Yep. Somebody else might have been drinking a beer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and there was a like a raid kind of weird thing where the police showed up and just started putting people in police cars. Okay. <laughs> and I ended up in the back of a police car. I ended up getting out of the police car and going home. Yep. But that was uh, the first time I thought, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen now? We had a, a similar thing when I was in high school where they uh – there were a bunch of us in a park just hanging out, you know, but doing a small town. And uh, the police put us in the back of the police car. Right. Parked in front of our each one of our houses, honked until our parents came to the door. We had to go up there, and their, our parents had to wave to, oh my gosh, to the police they, officers. Just so that you, they're like, we're going to let them deal with you three. Right. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, they let me go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's the first one I can remember. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, is there something that, you do that you need to do every day or your day just feels off any daily routines gosh you know i try to work out every day and that's an important break for me it's also just important for my health but it's not just physical health it's mental health yeah 
And it's easier to do when you're home than, than when you're on the road. When you're on the road. <laughs> I, you know, I make time in the mornings most of the time, uh, unless it's a very early morning to do that. So I guess that's the main thing. Yeah. Is that, uh, do you run? Is it going to the gym? I have a Peloton. Oh, Pel- you know, another one of those Peloton. Peloton yeah. bikes. Yeah. And uh, I do the Peloton and walk the dog. We have an old dog. So the walking is not much, <laughs> it's not really exercise, but yeah. it's, it's good for the, the mental health as well. There are, there have been quite a few people on the uh, podcast who have talked about the Peloton. So Jill and oh, I have yeah. started thinking about one. Oh, so. it's great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. the, the random question, what's the best album of all time? That, that album you can listen to from front to back. You know, I gave a lot of thought to that one. And um, you had mentioned the, uh, something that tells a story, yep. which made me think of Willie Nelson's album, Redheaded Stranger, okay. which is yep. basically a story from start to finish. Again, I'm dating myself. I, w- I was just going to uh, say, you're Texan though, so right. that's, uh, it, we need Willie Nelson on the playlist. Yeah, absolutely. The There's the so many great <laughs> albums up there, and I really do. I, I am a country music fan, but I like Lots of other kinds of music, too. But that's the one that came to mind. I love it. I love it. Uh, I'm a reader. You've already mentioned Good to Great. Jill and I have a stack of books at home that people have referred to us that we're trying to make our way through. Is there a book that you've either gifted to others or just think that everybody should read? Well, Good to Great is one of them. And uh, I've read it, I think, three times now. Not, I mean, you don't have to read it uh, front to back every time. But uh, the concepts in there, I think, are timeless. Yeah, well, and um, another one, which is interesting in our business, uh, but I think of it often, and I have gifted it a few times, is Blue Ocean Strategy. Okay, it's not anywhere near as prominent as um, no. Good to Great, but you know we're in this banking business, and but trying to approach it in a different way as not for profit financial cooperatives, and this idea that you know you can swim in this competitive ocean, or you can try and find this red ocean of, of competition and commoditized products, or you can try and find a blue ocean somewhere where you can swim without all the competition and the sharks. And so that's a cool one. And then another one I'd mentioned, which actually was one that was recommended to me and that we did sort of a book club when I worked for Arthur Anderson. So you have to take the book with a, a little bit of a, of a grain of salt yep. in the sense that I don't agree with probably... 75% of the stuff that's in there. <laughs> okay. But it's called the northbound train. Okay. And I do agree to a certain extent. And then the idea is essentially we're a northbound train and this is where we're headed. Uh, and so for us, that's member service. Yep. And you can get on the train and you can help us propel this train forward. Or quite frankly, there's lots of other opportunities out there for people who don't want to be on the train. And I, th- so like I said, there's, 75% of the stuff that I don't agree with because we're not, we don't kick people off the train. Yep. It's our job to try and help them understand why they want to be on the train. And it's, it also relates kind of to Jim Collins, good to great. You know, you get the right people on the bus. He yep. uses a bus. Yep. This is a train. This was a train. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, as you've gotten older, what, what's become uh, more important to you? And my favorite part of this question, what's yeah. become less important? What's become more important? What's become less important? I don't know. I need more sleep than I used to need. <laughs> Maybe that's more important. Yeah, that's become more important. Um, what's become less important to me? The Dallas Cowboys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, Chris, when Chrissy and I first met, I was uh, 18 years old and a absolutely massive Dallas Cowboys fan. Okay. Of course, the Dallas Cowboys back then were very different. I was just going to say. Than they are today. The, but yeah. I... It was funny because uh, we met in February, so it wasn't football season, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> right. Because you, 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 she may have said at that point, this guy's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> she got to bring but by her the in fall for months, when football yeah. season rolled around, and she's like, really? Okay, so the Longhorns play on, well, actually, my high school team would play on Friday. The Longhorns would play on Saturday, and the Cowboys would play on Sunday or Monday. You were going and all she's weekend. like, really? This is... This is how we're going to spend our weekends is with fo- so the Cowboys and it's not her fault. The Cowboys are less important. The Longhorns are probably more important. Um, but at least we have our Sundays. You have your spring. Sundays now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question I didn't send you. Um, when mm-hmm. you hear the word success, who's the first person that comes to mind? Well, sitting right here across from you uh, right now, it's Rudy Hanley, probably because of this conversation that yeah. we've been having. But I've been so fortunate to have so many people who've been 
you know, supporters and mentors who in their own right are successful. And so, you know, Dan Micah, who I followed at CUNA, was always was so extremely helpful to me and very successful. David Chatfield, a legend, same thing. Uh, Diana Dykstra, who is now the California Nevada League president, but she uh, was on the board uh, when I was hired. In fact, okay. she was one of the leaders of the search process and a good friend, not just professionally, but personally. Yep. Patsy Van Auerkirk, who's now retired. So many of my friends are retired. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Patsy was also involved in the search process at the league, and uh, we've always been very close. And we still stay together. She's involved in the global women's leadership, so it's great to, to see her and John you know, as we go forward, the list goes on and on. Stan Holland, you know, had a successful credit union career and then with Liberty and with co-op and he's now retired. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tom Doherty, who's retired. I know I could go on and on. It sounds like, <laughs> and not only friends, but a lot of great mentors there yes. as well. Um, yes. I, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of, you know, while we're, we're here in Mombasa. Yes. Um, Final question for you. Is there, do you have any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to, to say to the listeners? You know, I, I don't, there's never been a better time to be a credit union or to work in the credit movement. And I said that at the outset. Yep. And I think um, it's so important for us to stick together as a movement. So my final thought is, you know, we have a broad range of credit unions from small to large. And we all face different challenges. My hat's off to someone who can run a small credit union successfully with all of the regulatory pressures and the competitive pressures, uh, we face them at, at schools first, and we have a different set of, now, a different set of regulations and even a different set of regulators yep. uh, with the CFPB and the, and the ones group. But it's really critical that we stick together as a movement. So there are some who want to divide us, but they want to divide us because they want to conquer us. The bankers say they want to level the playing field. They have no interest in leveling the playing field. They want to clear the field. Absolutely. And they, they can only do that if they're successful in dividing us. So we've got to stick together, which means small credit unions may, need to support large credit unions, but large credit unions also need to support small credit unions. That is a beautiful way to wrap it up. We will link to everything we talked about today in the show notes. Is there a best way for people to contact you? LinkedIn, email, if they have more questions. So I'm on, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I think I'm pretty easy to find there. It's just Bill Cheney. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so that works well, although I'm not the world's best uh, <laughs> LinkedIn person in terms of messaging. Yep. My email the at schools best. first, which I'm sure you'll put in the we will uh, link show to notes, all of it. is good. And then Twitter, um, you can message on Twitter, right? Yeah, I'm, not a, I'm not a power <laughs> user, but at Bill Cheney all on right. Twitter. We will, we will link to all of those. So if uh, anybody has any additional questions, thank you again, Bill. This has been amazing, and I hope thank you enjoy you. the rest of the trip. It's been a blast. Thank you, Randy. Thank you.